I think it would be a fair comment to say that many people today who claim to be Christians, because probably they live in a Christian a country, uh, actually never read their Bible. There are also others who uh, have their own opinions as to what meaning a Christian or what a Christian means and what they believe and uh, what they feel is right for them to do or not to do as the case may be. And others feel that the Bible is a book that you can read if you want to but you don't have to read it to be, as it were, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there are others who perhaps have favourite passages of the Bible that they like to read but it's only those that have any meaning or relevance to them. Some others think that parts of the Bible are outdated, that it's not really for the 21st century. Others would say that there are parts of the Bible that really are obsolete now. They don't really affect us anymore, so what's the point in reading them? Others would claim, perhaps, that the Bible is a book that's really old-fashioned. After all, it is a very old book, isn't it? And then there are those that criticise the Bible and try to, as it were, destroy it in some way or other. They... Uh, they claim that um, really you don't need the Old Testament part of the Bible. That's where the criticism is usually aimed at. And in particular, it's aimed at the first few chapters of the Bible, which is the record of creation. And then there are those that maybe accept creation, but they can't accept it was created in the way the Bible reveals it. They've got to find some humanistic ideas that fit in with it uh, and try and balance the two together. And then, of course, there are those that say, well, the Bible's full of unbelievable stories. So, you know, really it's not a book for me. And then there are others who would say that um, those events that are written so long ago, particularly in the Old Testament records, have no relevance at all to somebody who claims to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is, true, can we actually please our souls about this book that claims to be the word of God, the creator of heaven and earth? Do we really need the Old Testament scriptures if we're seeking to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if his life and teaching are outlined in the, in the Gospels, which are found in the New Testament writings and in the writings of the Apostles, is the Old Testament that important to us? In other words, do we need to believe in the whole of the Bible? Well, of course, tonight, as Christadelphians, we, do, we believe that we do. And we'd like to just put forward some thoughts on why we believe the Bible tells us we need to read and understand and accept the whole of the Bible as the inspired word of God. And to do that, we want to let the Bible, as it were, give its own answer to that question. Do we need to read the whole of the Bible? And uh, we want to let the Bible answer that challenge and, and its statements for itself. But more especially, we want to show that the Old Testament is just as important and absolutely vital for our salvation as the New Testament uh, and, of course, if we neglect it, we neglect it at our peril. So let's begin by opening our Bibles together. And I want us to look at three enlightening passages about how the New Testament in particular tells us how important the Old Testament is. So will you turn with me, first of all, to the Epistle to the Romans, 
and chapter 15. The words we're going to look at are all the words of the inspired Apostle Paul, a man that was chosen by God to preach the gospel message about the salvation that he offers through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in Romans, writing to believers in the first century, he says this, so we're just going to pick up in the, uh, in the middle of a, a sort of a passage, but in verse 4 of chapter 15, he says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, and he's just quoted a passage from the Old Testament, so he's talking about the Old Testament scriptures, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written, he says, and this is to believers, this is to so-called New Testament Christians, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So if they're going to have some sort of hope for the future, says the Apostle Paul, They need the Old Testament scriptures as much as they need the writings, like the letter that the Apostle Paul was writing to them, this inspired letter to the Romans. They need those Old Testament scriptures to to understand and to find comfort and to learn in order that they might have a hope for the future. Come over to Uh, The next letter that the Apostle wrote that we have in our New Testament, 1 Corinthians, and this time, chapter 10. There are just two particular verses in this chapter that we pick out. And he's writing about events that occurred in the Old Testament, particularly earlier on in the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers, where God led his chosen people, Israel, out of slavery in Egypt and was bringing them to a promised land. And speaking of the events that that happened to these people, the way they behaved, the way they reacted to God and the things that God was doing for them, this is what the Apostle says in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 10. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we, New Testament believers, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And he goes on to talk about them being idolaters, about them committing fornication, about them murmuring. And he's saying we've got to learn from these examples of the Old Testament. They're important. That as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, God has recorded these events that we can learn from them and learn how to behave before God. And so he goes on again, he drives the point home in uh, verse 10, he says, sorry, verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples or examples, it's the same word, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the work the ends of the world or the ages are come and that was the ages in which they were living when God was going to bring about judgments upon the, uh, the people of God. So we can see then that the apostle is saying that those Old Testament scriptures that he's referring to were examples to warn us as believers how we ought to behave before God. And one of the passages that Paul wrote, come over to the second letter to to Timothy, will you, in chapter 3. And I think most of us in this room will recognize these as very familiar words that we've heard quoted from this uh, platform lots of times in the past. Paul this time is writing to a younger man, Timothy, who had worked with Paul. And he's reminding him of how he learnt about the things that he believes now. And he says in verse 14 of chapter 3, But continue thou, Timothy, in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is, 
given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And Paul wasn't just talking about New Testament scriptures that he believed were inspired. He was talking about the whole Bible, the Old Testament scriptures in particular, that were given by the inspiration, by the direct work of the Lord God upon men and women who retold those things that they were rec- that had recorded but for them. So those Old Testament scriptures, he says, were able to make us wise to salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were God-breathed, and as God-breathed, they were profitable to a man or a woman who claimed to be a man or woman of God, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we say, basically, all those words, all those passages are referring to the Old Testament part of our Bible, the part that men and women often want to reject. So, straight away we see then how important the whole of the Bible is to a true believer, to a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. What we want to do basically for the rest of our talk is to look at... um, four testimonies, if you like, to the importance of the Old Testament to show that we need the whole of the Bible to understand the purpose of God. We're going to look at some words that were spoken by the angel Gabriel. We're going to have a look at some words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, some words of the Apostle Paul, And we're going to end up by looking at that chapter that we read together as our introductory reading, the words of the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2. So let's begin with the words that God gave the angel Gabriel to speak that are found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. And these were the words spoken, of course, to the Virgin Mary about the child that she was going to bear, who the angel tells her was going to be the Son of God. But it's interesting to read exactly what the angel said. Verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary and this is what the angel said unto her verse 30 fear not Mary for thou hast found favour with God and behold thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus he shall be great he shall be called the son of the highest And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto him, How shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore that... Also that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now Mary would be able to understand all of that message, but if we're reading these words for the first time and we're being taught that really to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ you only need to read the New Testament, at least that's all you need in the the Bible, then I think you would have trouble understanding the whole of this message. Mary is promised a son who's to be called Jesus and he's going to be the son of the highest, the son of God, and it says that twice in this record, doesn't it? But then it says something else. He says that he's going to be given the throne of David and he's going to reign over the house of Jacob forever 
And the kingdom that he's going to reign over will have no end. Now, unless we understand who David is, unless we understand what the house of Jacob stands for, and what the Bible says about a kingdom, we're going to have difficulty understanding this message of the angel to Mary. And that's where, of course, we need the Old Testament scriptures. Because in the Old Testament scriptures, God actually makes a promise to this man, David. It's therefore going to be a fulfillment of this promise. Because in the second book of Samuel, chapter 7... And verses 12 to 16, this promise that God made to David was the promise of a descendant who was to be God's son. That he would sit on David's throne and reign over his kingdom forever. That was the promise that God made. Unless you know about that promise, the angel Gabriel's words to Mary don't fully make sense for us. But with our Old Testament scriptures, we can see and we can work out and we can understand that God had a purpose, a purpose of setting up a worldwide kingdom upon this earth and that he was going to bring about the birth of his own son to sit upon the throne that existed in the past when Israel were a kingdom in the land that God had promised them but sadly were removed because of disobedience. One day that kingdom is going to be restored and Jesus is going to be the king over it. But to understand that, we need to understand what the Old Testament says. And so we need the whole of our Bible to truly understand the purpose of God and the work that he was going to accomplish through his beloved son. Without the Old Testament, Gabriel's words, as we say, would be in a sense, meaningless. So, the question is, for us, this is the kingdom that Jesus preached about when he preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. This is the purpose of God that he he spoke about during his ministry. So, if we want to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're going to be a true Christian, inverted commas, And we need to understand about this kingdom, this gospel, this good news. And we can only do that by going and reading the whole of the word of God. But what about the words of Jesus himself? Let's go over to the end of the gospel of Luke, to Luke chapter 24. And... uh, If we know our New Testament Bibles, if we know about the Gospel records, we will know that this chapter takes place, or the events in this chapter take place, after Jesus' crucifixion and after the resurrection of Jesus. And what happens is that there are two disciples on a journey to Emmaus from Jerusalem, a village a little bit further out. And uh, they're walking along talking about the events concerning the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus and what they expected this man, this Jesus of Nazareth to to do, who was a prophet, who was a a man mighty in deed and word. And they, they, they were confused about the fact that he was put to death, buried, and, and that was it. And... Uh, They're talking about it, and this stranger comes along and speaks to them. And if we know the story in the record in Luke's Gospel, this stranger is, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who had been raised from the dead. And this is what Jesus says to these two disciples in verse 25. He says, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So he says, ought not Christ to have actually had these things happen to him? And then to enter into his glory? And of course, they hadn't got an answer really. But the answer is 
that he says in verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus gave them what we would call a, a massive Bible class. He spends time referring to various passages right from the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, through the prophets, in all the scriptures. He says, look, here was a prophecy about me or about the Christ because they didn't know it was Jesus at the time. Here is a prophecy about the work of God through the Messiah. Here is another prophecy. This is what it says about his death. This is what it says about his resurrection. This is what it says about him going to heaven. This is what it says about the kingdom to come. And he was explaining these things to them. And gradually they were beginning to understand. And eventually he reveals himself to them. And they understand that this is Jesus. This is the one. And they... Verse 32, it says, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us in the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? What a fantastic Bible class that would be for two men or a man or a woman to have the whole of the word of God, as it were, in the Old Testament. All the prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ being revealed to them by the Lord himself. But it doesn't end there, because if we just turn over a few, uh, a few uh, well, a page in my Bible, but it might not be in yours, to verses um, 44 and 45, Jesus is now with his 12 disciples. He's, um, he's been raised, he appears to them, he's speaking to them, and this is what he says. These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead, and the third day that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among the nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. So again, a terrific Bible class was held in that room where Jesus appeared to his disciples. And from the books of Moses, through the prophets, through the Psalms, the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to them the words in the Old Testament that were prophecies of that which was going to happen to him and that which was going to happen in the future when Jesus returns to the earth. So again we can see how important it is to have both parts of the word of God. We need the New Testament and we need the Old Testament scriptures as well. What about the witness of the Apostle Paul? Well, come over to the epistle to the Romans, will you? Because Paul made reference to the Old Testament scriptures throughout his preaching and throughout his letters. And this is a good example in the epistle to the Romans. We're not going to be able to look at the whole of this letter that Paul wrote We've already looked at um, one passage, haven't we, at the beginning. But Paul is talking about the gospel of Christ, the good news, which is the power of God to salvation, he says, to everyone that believeth. This is the gospel message that he was preaching. And he's telling us that salvation can only come by belief in God's provision of the Lord Jesus Christ as a saviour. But that begs the question, why do people need to be saved? Why do we need 
salvation. Well, Paul sets out to show this in the rest of the epistle. And uh, one of the uh, important passages that we have is in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, where he says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you go back some verses to verse 10 down to verse 18, you will find that there are passage after passage after passage after passage that he quotes in those verses from the Old Testament scriptures to show that very fact that there is no one that can stand before God and say that they are right and they are just and they are sinless. All have sinned, all are under sin, all come short of the glory of God. So he's using the Old Testament scriptures to teach the gospel of salvation. And uh, what he then goes on to show is that the reason we are sinners and the reason we need salvation is because right at the very beginning, in the very book of Genesis, the book that people like to destroy, to get rid of, to take no notice of, is the story of how sin began through the result of Adam's sin right at the beginning when God created him and gave him a law to keep. And so he says in Romans uh, chapter 5 and verse 12, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So we've got a situation now, haven't we, where we're in need of salvation. And God provides that remedy, that salvation, through his only Son. And so in verse 19, he says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one... That's the Lord Jesus Christ who is spoken about in the verses previous to that. Many shall many be made righteous or right in the, in the eyes of God. So through, and we need to read the rest of the scriptures to understand this, through the obedient sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, through God's grace, we can have the hope of life. He says in verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul is showing us that we need to know and we need to understand and we need to accept the creation record of Genesis and the sin of Adam and Eve and its consequences we need to understand that first of all because if we don't then the life and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely meaningless because there was no sin, there was no death from which to be saved. If we get rid of Adam, if we say we can't accept the Genesis record, if we, if we can't accept that Adam was the first man that God created and that he sinned, and God brought about death as a result, if we can't believe that, we don't need the Lord Jesus Christ because there's no sin, there's no death to be saved from. We just are like the animal kingdom. We're born and we die naturally and that's all there is to it. But what the gospel message of salvation is about is the way in which God through the Lord Jesus Christ provides that way in which we can be saved from sin and have the hope of eternal life in the kingdom of God. And so we see how important the whole of the Bible is to understanding the purpose of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go to our final witness to the witness of the Apostle Peter and back to our reading that we began with in Acts chapter 2. This is on the events that took place on what's called the day of Pentecost. Uh, 
where Peter and the rest of the apostles had been given the power of the Holy Spirit, which enabled them to speak in different languages and preach the gospel to all the people that came from different countries that were in Jerusalem at that time. And he talks to them about the Lord Jesus Christ, as we read in those verses. Jesus was a man approved by God, who was delivered by the, the, the counsel and foreknowledge of God. In other words, God had a purpose with his son. He knew what was going to happen to him. He knew he was going to have to die. And he says, you have crucified, but God raised him up from the dead. And notice what he does then in his talk. From verse 25 down to verse 35, in those 11 verses, the apostle actually quotes about three, or, or, or quotes from three Old Testament passages to prove what he's saying about the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that God raised him from the dead is foretold, he says, by David in what we will call Psalm 16 in our Bible. And then he, he, he goes back to that passage that we, we refer to when we were looking at the words of the angel Gabriel to Mary, 2 Samuel chapter 7, the promise that God made to David that he would have a descendant, the Christ, that would sit on David's throne. And for that to happen, Jesus had got to be raised from the dead. So he's quoting from 2 Samuel 7. And then he talks about God raising his son up and exalting him to sit at his right hand until he returns to sit on David's throne over God's kingdom. And this was a fulfillment of the words that God gave through David in Psalm 110. And he uses that to show that the Lord Jesus Christ is therefore both Lord and Christ. So you see in this, as it were, first very the very first speech, as it were, that the apostles gave about the gospel message that Jesus had commissioned them to preach to all the world, the very first speech that was given by these apostles in Jerusalem, the apostle uses these three passages, key passages from the Old Testament. Without those key passages, he wouldn't have been able to get over the message that they needed to tell, to tell the people about the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see then how important those Old Testament scriptures are to the word of God and to understanding the purpose of God. But what was the response of the people to what they heard? Well, we read it there, didn't we? In, um, in verse 37, the people asked the question, what do we do? What do we do to be saved? We, we realize what you're saying, but what do we need to do to be saved? And Peter's reply was that they needed to repent and to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the record, as we read, goes on to tell us that 3,000 people responded to this message. They understood that they needed salvation when they'd heard this uh, gospel being preached to them. And so they repented, first of all. They, they turned their lives around. That was what they'd got to do. They received the word of God. They believed. And then they were baptized, completely submerged in water and brought out as if they were enacting a death and a resurrection, just like the Lord Jesus Christ's literal death and burial and resurrection. And then they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in, their, in his f fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And my dear friends and young people, the gospel message doesn't change. And if you're going to believe the word of God, the whole word of God, 
you need to respond in the same way if you want to be saved from sin and death. So that's the message that we're trying to get over tonight, that the Bible has a message of hope for the future. It can tell us how we can be saved from sin and death. But in order to be part of that purpose of God when Jesus Christ returns, to fully understand that plan of salvation through his Son, we must believe the whole of the Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments. And we pray that you will indeed read this book for yourself and that you will understand that gospel message and by God's grace share with us in that hope of eternal life in the age to come.